Great. Well, welcome so much to creating a success environment for our children and our students. Um, we're going to cover scheduling and location, environment, and content, and a little bit on the role of parents. And then at the end, we're going to have a Q&A for any questions I didn't answer. So this is all about an individualized, self-paced, goal-focused education. Is that a mouthful or what? But that's what we're all about, and that's really what we need. So when we do that, it starts first with a parent with children who need to be educated. And then it can grow to groups of multiple families who are working together and pulling their resources. And that grows into organizations to set up and serve families. If you're building a group, never forget that the families are the customers. Any organization or group is set up to support the family's goals for education of their children. Now the schedule. The needs of the families and the students are key. There is no perfect formula that applies to every single student. Here are some basic studied and proven recommendations. First, number one, cover the academics in the morning. Cover them before lunch. Start the day with productivity. Everyone is more alert and open to learning. Number two, start at the beginning of the day, but leave time for families to have time together before school. Finish up academics before lunch is number three. Number four, leave enough days each week for family time. Many families benefit from having structured school days mixed with family learning days where the family can practice the schedule at home on their own. We don't live for school. School should support our lives. Number five, limiting the days and hours allows for students to enjoy learning and want more. There have been documented studies showing that students are inspired or students who are inspired are allowed to learn on their own time. They choose more hours doing academics than students who are required to attend full days of school and do daily homework. Isn't that cool? And I've seen that in my own home. Sometimes we have to go and do forceful, turn the lights out. I know you're really enjoying the science project, but it's time for bed. And that's just wonderful to see kids who wanna learn. And don't discount the true adage of quality over quantity. The other side is we do not want to burn out the parents. Don't burn out the parents and the families. And then number six is start and end with prayer. It's part of our schedule. It's so important. Just like when we understand the value of having personal prayer and then having family prayer. As a group or a school, we need to invite the right spirit into our space. And we can do that by starting and ending with prayer. So when we start our day, we have a welcome. Um, we talk about any group business. We have the pledge, a song, a prayer, and then a devotional talk. And that all happens before the academics. And all of those pieces are led by the students. So for location, for a family, it's really great to pick a specific location that is appropriate for what is to be learned and to set up what you need in close proximity so that learning can just flow and that time can just be used for you know, learning and exploring and practicing, and you avoid those breaks to go and find things that you want to work with. For a group, the same rules apply. A consistent space that has the necessary pieces. Furniture can be super simple. It could be as easy as places to sit and flat surfaces to work on. When we get into the bigger organizations, we'll talk more specifically about that in our material, but how to build a, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit more about how to build a school in a rented or owned space but the highest priority is to have a safe, clean, consistent space that allows for a good environment that is within an appropriate range of cost and distance to the participating families. So just for a second, let's talk about the environment. When the students walk into the room, they should feel that they've entered a happy and safe place. If we have visitors into that learning space, they should feel that there's that spirit of learning and excitement for what's happening there. There should be a focus on the love of learning a focus on positivity, and there should be value to what is being learned. When we talk about rules, the rules should really revolve around respect for each other and using principles of self-government. We're not gonna get into that a lot today, but students who are taught these principles in a loving way and treated as responsible for their own choices and their own actions are given a chance to really have that ownership over that space and how they're participating and wanting to be there. So, content. The content of our learning day, there's really two parts of content. And this is just gonna be a brief overview of the content that we use as tools to achieve. 
Core subjects are those that every student needs. Regardless of personality and goals, the level of achievement and even application may be different, but these are the basics that we all need. Parents and other adults who do not have strengths here may want to jump in and build this foundation for themselves. And you might be surprised how many people feel that way, but they don't feel comfortable with that. But what a great inspiration for the kids that have that mom that says, oh, I'm not good at math. And she jumps right in and learns with them. It's wonderful. So let's go to core subjects. Core subject number one is religion. Yes, faith should be a core subject of study and focus in our religion, or excuse me, in our education. It is vitally important to have this as a priority by starting the day with a devotional and incorporating messages of faith in every subject. We recommend leaving more in-depth religious studies to each family or student on their own time. There are wonderful curriculums for studying religious subjects out there, subjects on faith, subjects on scripture, and when the opportunity arises for a group that all want to incorporate this study into their group or school, we won't discourage that, but there is more often the reality that each family has a different subject of study that they would like to focus on at any given time, and we should not take away from that. So two quotes that I love. One is Samuel Adams. He says, religion and good morals are the only solid foundation of public liberty and happiness. And then John Adams said, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. So I love that. And speaking of some of our founding fathers, when we study history, we are learning to ponder. This is our favorite subject for individual or family study when meeting together with the group to discuss. History is a study of God's dealings with man and man's dealings with man. Any history that excludes the involvement of our creator is borderline useless. The, the cycles of history have so much to teach us about ourselves. We encourage studying a period of time outside of school or group time, then meeting together to not only discuss, but apply the lessons learned to our lives. To go further, um, you can create a project at home to be shared with a group that reflects that period of history, event, or person. Projects can be anything where understanding of the information is apparent and creativity is given room to share what has been learned with others. Some ideas, of course, are the almighty shoebox diorama. But we've seen songs written, we've seen plays, artwork, and many other expressions. So here I'd like to take a little note or share a little note on creativity from one of my favorite speakers. In the talk called Happiness, Your Heritage by President Uchtdorf, he says, creation brings deep satisfaction and fulfillment. We develop ourselves and others when we take organized matter into our hands and mold it into something of beauty. And I am not talking about the process of cleaning the rooms of your teenage children. You or your students may say, I am not the creative type. When I sing, I'm always half a note above or below the note. I cannot draw a line without a ruler. And the only practical use for my homemade bread is a paperweight or as a doorstop. Well, if that is how you think, feel, think again, and remember that you are spirit children of the most creative being in the universe. Isn't it remarkable to think that you, your very spirits, are fashioned by an endlessly creative and eternally compassionate God? Which leads me to the next core academic subject, science. Science is for learning how to search. Learning how to search for truth and checking all truth in your scriptures. As students study out details in each discipline in science, if they leave out what their creator said on the subject, aren't they missing the most important piece? Moses 6, verse 63 says, And behold, all things have their likeness. All things are created and made to bear record of me, both things which are temporal, things which are spiritual, things which are in the heaven above, and things which are on earth, and things which are, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me, things which are in the earth, and things which are under the earth, both above and beneath, all things bear record of me. So, all things testify of our God. As we joy in the study of his creations, we are also strengthened in our understanding of what he does for us. Some concepts of science can be found in a very literal sense in your scriptures. Some are more of a type or analogy. When learning in a group, there are huge benefits to choosing a general discipline of science to study, then choosing a category to share together what individual students are learning. For example, our group this year is studying physiology. Each student is creating his own science book as they research vocab words. Then, so on their own, they're defining and illustrating these concepts. Then we meet together to explore each of the different systems of the body. And individual students, they're going to very different depths of study. Each student is making different connections from these concepts to truth and scripture, 
But then when we come together, we're all learning from each other. So the next core subjects are all self-paced, and that means that each student could be at a different principal and they are done independently. The first one is language arts. The value of language arts is to lose yourself in academic service to others. The art of communication should be used for service. Think about the power of teaching language this way. A student starts with the principle of language arts explained, then meaningful examples are given. After some practice, this all leads the student to choosing someone and thoughtfully creating something that serves that person, using the principle of language that they have learned and practiced. Group time for language arts starts with an opportunity to share good experiences giving service or sharing creative ideas to serve others. Then students are given time to quietly work. For math, it helps you learn to think and self-govern using correct principles. One principle at a time, each student learns the concept, sees an example, practices, creates their own examples, then applies the principle to everyday experience. Principles of math are the perfect opportunity to challenge yourself and to learn the value of accuracy. Equality as important, <clears throat> excuse me, equally as important is applying each academic principle to the student's current stage of life or a gospel principle. Students understand what they are learning in math and then they want to learn more. They learn how to neatly and accurately create their own challenging exercises. They aren't held back from learning more as they are ready and they are given time to practice more with principles where they need more time. For class time, it is so fun to start with a game that teaches a mathematic principle or have a demonstration that shows a fun application or practice using hands-on tools to exercise math concepts. Then give time for the students to work independently and challenge themselves. When concepts are learned this way, they are learned for good and do not need the constant review of basic information and skills which make up so much of the day at a traditional government school. Concepts are really learned and applied first, then built on with preceding concepts. So like we discussed, there is no homework assigned by teachers. Parents are the guide to set expectations with students for depth and pace. So who checks all this work that is done by the students? That's right, the parents. Parents of young students lead all the steps of PDCA. They plan goals of quality and quantity with their children. They do support the efforts of their children. Sometimes that means checking in and sometimes it means leading by example. Sometimes it means getting their children to a group where a teacher is an advocate for the family's goals. They check the work, correcting and requesting more where appropriate. They check the reviews and tests to see what their children have learned and what they have left to learn. They adjust the focus of learning when needed. Parents know what is needed or what needs to be adjusted when they are the ones overseeing the education of their children. So parents of older children support all the same steps but transition some of the responsibility to their children as they mature. They counsel with their children as they plan their goals of quality and quantity. Their children do their schoolwork at their own pace, being self-motivated. Parents still check the work, correcting and requesting more where appropriate. And when the children get to work that is beyond what the parents are familiar with, the parents can check with either a mentor or somebody who specializes in that and then brings that back to the student. And then older students adjust with the guidance of their parents to keep the focus on their end goals never losing their why. Um, one of my favorite parts about a personalized education is that it allows for specialized subjects. So these are also known as electives, but the biggest difference between these and traditional electives is the reason why we choose them. Choose electives that support the development of the student towards their chosen goals and dreams. Electives are more than fun, they inspire us. I shared this story last time about George Washington um, he learned how to ride a horse and ballroom dance to learn posture and presence. Think about the value we learn from our activities. How could your, what could your students do if they need to learn cooperation and patience? What electives could you seek out if they need to learn confidence and stage presence? The possibilities are endless. This is also a perfect situation where a community can share its local talent to bless the next generation. I will not go through all the possible elective classes. You are welcome. Um, for, each, for each one that you consider, check it with the goals of your students. Does the class teach what is most important? Some classes can even be adjusted for specialized benefits to the participants. For example, an art class that is taught in segments that follow the creation story. 
Wouldn't that be amazing for students who are interested in art? Oh, I love that program that we have. So now I would like to turn on the video. Thank you for listening and for watching. This is my passion and I am so grateful to share with you. Thank you for learning more about education restoration. We are changing the world and making a personalized education accessible to everyone. Contact us if you have any questions or would like to participate. We will be publishing more content, at least weekly, online at AmericanFamilyEducation.com under the Define, Learn, Do tab. If you're looking for content of a subject that we have not covered yet, please text or email me through our website at AmericanFamilyEducation.com. Thank you. Until next time. Bye. Oh, hello, everybody. And I'm going to unmute you guys. So if anybody has something really loud, you feel free to mute yourself. Do you guys have any questions or anything that I didn't answer? As you're going through this, like, I homeschooled my older children, and this is, like, right down the line, what we did. And okay. so it's like, oh, uh -huh, this is all sounding very familiar. Um, so as far as uh, questions, I don't have questions, but, uh, and, you know, what to focus on, but this is just, um, it's just so common sense. That's great. Oh, and Tracy, the perspective I get or the perception I get from you is that you probably have a lot to add. And so have you seen that first video that we produced? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did not see the question oh, answer part, but I watched the okay. you presentation. You yeah. would be one of those golden people that I would say, if you love that, oh, I would hope that you would share the talents and the experience that you have with others as they're trying to figure this out. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much for still caring. That's awesome. Some examples of like language arts or math or science, you know, what have been some cool experiences you guys have had recently and some success you've gotten to see with your kids with doing this? Absolutely. Cool. Okay. How so old are your children? Oh, my children? Uh -huh. My children, my oldest is 12. Okay. And then I have 11, 8. She's going to be 4 soon and then going to be 2 soon. Okay. So, kind of a little spread. Um, so some things that we've loved, like history. My kids are apparently much better at absorbing history than I am. I did not get a love of learning history in school. I was public school educated. And so I've been kind of assigning them to go out and learn and bring it back. And then when we discuss that, they make those connections so fast. Oh, it's so fun. And just to see children's brains of, wait, that's very similar to what happened in this country over here. They see those cycles so easily, we just have to give them a chance by really teaching them real history. Um, with math, I, I kind of hinted about chocolate bar magic before. That was way fun. But to get my kids so excited about math and to help them understand that in all these practices, all the games, all the hands-on manipulatives, the different things that we've done, to me, the whole point of math is that you want to get to the right answer, but we think differently, and it's so fun to stretch our thinking and try different ways. And any teacher that says, you can only teach math in this specific way because you have to just think like this, they're missing the whole point of math, right? There's not a mathematician that created anything and is famous who had that kind of thinking that that would only be you know, that his way would be the only way ever in the world. He was just so excited to share that he figured out maybe a backdoor way or a fast way or something that could be visualized. And that's the fun of math. And so when you give kids that room and when you apply it to everyday life, they understand why they want to do it. But with my son, we were doing the everyday life and some principles are a little repetitive. And so one example with that is we talked about decimals. We said, okay, well, if you need something besides everyday life, find a gospel principle that works with decimals. And so we talked about um, that, and I gave him some room to think about it. And he came up with that a decimal number that has the, you know, the piece that's less than the whole and the decimal point and the whole number, that's like the plan of salvation. So the piece that's not whole, it's like before we came to earth, and then the point is coming to earth, that's earth, getting our bodies. And then when we're a whole number, we have infinite potential for growth. And, oh, that's fun. So learning the three parts. Awesome. Isn't that great? Also fun. How old, how old was this child when they came up with that? Uh, 
nine and a half. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. That's incredible. It's so fun. My son, and like my other stories about him too. So science, because he's my kid where public school was the worst for him because he really easily thinks far and makes connections where my daughter really comfortably fit into the box and it was hard for her to stretch out. And now she's just thriving. Oh, it's so fun. But my son for science, we say, okay, you study this out. He was studying about clownfish, you know, fish in the ocean, clownfish are cute. So he drew it out really nice. And I said, great, find that in the scriptures. And there's no clownfish in the scriptures, right? Mm -hmm. There are fish, which is kind of a stretch. If you're doing a whole section on fish, you can't use that for all of them. You have to come up with something different. So all I did was give the leading question of, well, what is the point of a clownfish? You know, what's something that's unique about them? And he like spiraled real quick into, well, a clownfish takes care of the sea anemone. It brings it little bits of food and it cleans off the bad, dirty parts so that it can be healthy. And a clownfish is like Christ because Christ does that for us. So it's a type of Christ. And, you know, I'm like, oh. <laughs> it was so awesome. So that was, that was really cool. So those are some of the things that you get to, the conversations you get to have with your kids when you're telling them all of the world is connected and it all works together and you give them room to think that way. Oh, it's so fun. So it's great. Did I miss anything? Oh, language arts. So with language arts with my kids, they're more careful with the words they use with each other because every day we talk about communication is meant to serve others. So that message is given and the practice is by creating for other people. So just in the way that they talk to each other, you know, they all started out thinking that all the service projects had to be for people in our own family. And now they're expanding out and they're starting to think about other people and doing service for other people. So that's been really just, you know, it's just wonderful. I think we don't get enough opportunities for service if we're busy running around every day. So that's been really fun. So that's been cool. And you'll see, I don't know if you've looked at one of the documents that I put up on the website for our student leadership activities that we do once a week now. One of the activities is coming up with, an, like you're doing a game. Who can think of the most names? And that has been a really fun list to work off of. This is actually Harmony's idea working off this list of people that have done nice things in their life, that's who they can do some academic service for. Now they have this list of people that have done nice things. It's their turn to do something back. So that's been really fun. So yeah, right. the answer, what you guys are looking for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, your long-term long goals are not just for your family, but for what you're doing. Yeah, the, the long-term goals for me, personally are crazy and wonderful to just change the whole world to make sure that every single family knows that if they would like to have a personalized education they can and like part of the Q&A that was at the end of the video there was one question that I don't know if it was easy to hear but it was one of my favorite questions um, Mike Reed who's this wonderful guy he goes and he teaches constitution as service to schools and families and he said well what do we do when the only kids left in public school are those that want to be babysat or need to be babysat. I guess the kids don't want it. The parents need a babysitter. What are we going to do? I said, well, you know, that's okay, right? To change things. Like when the constitution was written and our government got installed, we didn't have a hundred percent of the population that understood that was important, right? It was a very small percentage. If we have enough of a percentage that know what to do, then when money gets taken away from the public schools and they close because they're failing and they can't even fake that they're being successful because now the kids that would have succeeded anyways are doing something even better and they close, there's enough of us that will be able to say, come, we know what to do. We can help. There's kind of a system now. You don't have to do everything on your own. It's no more survival mode. And so that's the goal is to get there as fast as we can. And one of the things that I love is we're able to utilize, you know, systems of people that are already thinking about if there's a problem, we find a solution and we do something about it. So we're tapping in to those veins of really powerful people and showing them that when you talk to somebody about education, don't you dare tell them what book to buy. Don't tell them what subject to focus on. You know, give them room, but make sure that they're focusing on true principles and starting with why. 
And that has been so fun because that's a lot 